Schumann's number 10, Fast zu Ernst, which is almost too serious, follows the, the rocking horse piece, the Night of the Rocking Horse. <laughs> We go from that C major uh, to this more somber G sharp minor piece. It goes down a major third from a major key, C major, to G sharp minor. And what makes this piece kind of tricky is because, you know, if you hear the melody and you didn't have tied over notes across the measures, you wouldn't have to be worried about syncopations because he ties over the principal melody notes and creates the, these offbeats. So you get this, and I'll clap as I tie over it like this. So you get the main beats, and then they're fleshed out because they're tied. So it gets confusing if the listener kind of hears a forced syncopation. First thing to do is maybe just think of a melody going across when you're first learning it like this. That's what I would do first. Now what's very interesting about it, if you map out the key you're in, just in that phrase, it sounds like it would have been G-sharp minor, but with the left hand added in, you're going to find out that the first half of the phrase is in G-sharp minor, and the next part of it, based upon what modulation you're going to have in the, afforded by the left hand, is that it goes into B major, which is the relative major of G-sharp minor. You have the soprano line with the offbeats, and then you have a little alto line, and what I would do is I would just play the alto notes, which are these. It doesn't really go very far. And so what's really happening is you're inserting these little alto um, notes to create a rich, richer harmony for the melody. So let's see what happens if we add them. And actually I'm going to do the syncopation. we went into B major. Now to further enrich the harmony, we have the left hand, which you have bass notes, and I would go through all the bass notes in each measure to hear the bass line, and here it clearly went to B major. We still don't have enough information to actually know how beautifully this is spun when it adds the various voices. Now, we can block what would be these three groups of, these three notes grouped together are going to follow the bass, the little off the beat. He loves this off the beat kind of thing in this one. Here it comes, the king, perfect authentic cadence in B major. You can hear it now clearly. bass line, you have to think about these strands of threes, which create more harmony because they're broken chords. Um, and in relation to the right hand moving and the insertion of the alto, it creates a beautiful harmonic mosaic. It's really quite beautiful the way he strands these voices together. Um, I would suggest again the blocking of the three note groupings. There's a harmonic change that affects the way you phrase. So if you start in a somber G sharp minor, and then you have a crescendo by the composer, he happens to do it as he's going into the brighter key. So that's why harmonic rhythm is important. So he's 
intensifying as he goes into the B major. So if we go slowly, really slowly, let's see what happens when we insert everything together and how this works. So we have the tied over note creating the syncopation in the right hand, the bass, which is important, and the after beats, and the melody, and the alto. Keep the alto soft. But I want to hear that bass. And then I want to hear the melody upstairs. I'm doing it so slowly. Because there's certain notes that have to be held down. Now what you have here is a clash of harmony. If I play this together as if it weren't tied, you can hear that's very, very dissonant. But it's tied over, so you lose that sh the shrieky dissonance and it blends in. It's a little tension, but not that much. So I'm doing it slowly for that reason to hear those clashes. Here's another one. Not as much clashing there. Now this is a diminished chord that's going to fold into the B major uh, transition in the perfect authentic cadence. And this should be bigger. Because we're in that brighter key. Tie over, dissonance. There's the dissonance. And then we're going to stay in B major. And if we just did this first, See, I'm not doing, I'm not trying to syncopate now. I just want to hear the thread of the melody and what it's doing. It's getting bigger because now he's going into another key from B major. Actually, what he's doing is going back, not back, but to the D sharp minor. That's quite an interesting thing now to go from B major up a third to a minor key. So, so far we've had the G sharp minor, the B major up a third, and up another third, D sharp minor. Got to know that. Got to know that as you're playing, you're listening for harmonic changes. Then we might analyze the alto voice. You could say mi fa mi because I'm thinking B major here. But here I'm going to think movable do, D sharp minor. Me. I need to know that. And again, those are folded in. I wouldn't think of that as a counterpoint at all. I would think of it as just creating additional harmony to support this gorgeous melody. And again, taken together with these descending three note sixteenths that are broken chords and a bass that's a supportive foundation to everything, you have the four voices creating a gorgeous harmonic um, thread, as I said before. So now, we have basically the same pattern of the rhythm, and we have the same pattern of the three sixteenths and a bass. We just have to learn the notes. Now on the left hand, you can do some blocking like this. Now this is a very interesting interval here, and they tell you to use one, two, four. I can't reach one, two, four when I block it, but when I don't block it, I can rotate. But you get a dissonance here of a minor ninth. are fleshed out too much it gets a, it gets a kind of unevenness to it instead of a horizontal quality and you always want to preserve the horizontal quality and it's tricky because there are notes that have to be held down so this is here's that ninth that's formed from one and five so that's purely a dominant of B major 
Fisher. this is at the ends of these phrases he puts a fermata it's an extra hold and he also has right before it a ritardando so every one of these strands has a ritardando most of them anyway most of them do and you have to decide when do you start the next phrase and you don't want to gasp so that's another challenge of this where you do something like this let's see this let's say I'm holding it it's fading and decaying, and then there's a 16th rest. So you have to somehow match the decay and not disrupt that transition over to the next phrase. Now, what we're doing here, let's see what keys we're in. We're back to G sharp minor. Now you can hear it's the same pattern all the way through. And I'm going so slowly, but I would be blocking first. To the dominant of G sharp minor. That's the dominant of G sharp minor. Here we are. Now there's that extra hold. You have to let it decay so that you can pick it up on the decay. Here we're back to G sharp minor. It's going so slowly just to, to analyze everything correctly. Now this is interesting. Goes from an E major chord to an E minor chord. He's going back to B major by way of a minor four chord of B major, which would be E minor, which is leading to a dominant of B major with a seventh. See, all these dissonances are passing through. But you have to remember to hold over that. There's that dissonance and the carryover across the measure. But the bass. And then he's going back to the beginning. I'm doing way behind tempo just to show. Hear that? That's a dissonance carried over the measure. You have to really listen for that and not let anything drown out the, the treble. So the balance is 571 B major. Resolve it down. Intensify. 